So in this video, we want to um, introduce reproducing offspring, a very introductory video for our genetics unit. I just want to go over some quick vocabulary concepts in genetics first, and then I want to focus on modes of reproduction and some adaptations that different organisms have for reproducing offspring successfully. So let's just talk about some basic vocabulary first. I want to talk about that genetic information inside the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. Um, and all cells have um, versions of this. Um, but I want to talk about the difference between DNA, genes, and chromosomes. And so uh, maybe we could start with the most zoomed in concept. Uh, if we were to kind of really zoom in as, as strongly as possible, we might see this sort of classic double helix shaped um, DNA chemical. DNA really is the chemical that, um, uh, as we'll see, has particular sequence of chemicals, A's, T's, C's, and G's, that ultimately teach a cell how to build a protein correctly. Um, we could think of maybe a string um, or a large sequence of that chemical code being a gene. So maybe a gene has thousands of uh, uh, chemicals in a particular order that teaches the cell how to build a particular protein. And then if we think about the entire chemical um, in, its, in its length, maybe hundreds of thousands or even millions of, of DNA base pairs, maybe that would represent an entire chromosome. And so sometimes it's uh, strange for students to, to think about this, but at least in our eukaryotic human cells and all eukaryotes have multiple pieces of DNA um, that are actually physically separate from each other in the nucleus. Or maybe another way to put this, if I were actually to take um, like molecular tweezers small enough to kind of poke into one of my cells and grab all of my genetic information, kind of one hair at a time, as it were, then I would actually be able to pull out in my human cells 46 different hairs um, from my body cells. There are actually 46 different pieces of DNA, each with maybe different genes on them in different locations um, that would teach my cell how to build all the proteins necessary. So the reason why I want to focus on this for the purposes of talking about reproduction broadly is that we're going to see in later conversations about cell division that really the priority of making any new offspring cell is going to be to be able to uh, successfully pass on those chromosomes carrying the genes on them to um, offspring cells. And so um, um, that's just kind of a quick vocab review. Let's just talk about modes of reproduction, advantages of those modes, and then we'll kind of move on to just some quick adaptations. Um, two basic ways to reproduce offspring in uh, biology, and that's asexually or not sexually, just involving one parent passing all of their DNA onto the offspring cell, or sexually, which involves two parents. And so if we want the offspring to have their full set of DNA, maybe it makes sense for the parents to pass on halves. So you sort of have one half from dad, one half from mom combining together, and you have the full set again. Um, if we were to represent, say, sexual and asexual reproduction in terms of chromosomes, maybe there's a species um, that in their nucleus has four chromosomes total. Um, there are some species that do that, but I can't think of one offhand. Um, so maybe these colored lines represent long strands of DNA chemical, um, uh, an entire strand. So uh, the red and the green would represent chromosomes here. As we'll see, oftentimes body cells have two sets of chromosomes. We'll call these homologous pairs perhaps later. Um, and I've tried to highlight a gene on each of these chromosomes. The R gene apparently is carried on the red chromosome set, and the G gene is carried on the green chromosome set. Um, you'll notice that I've also given uppercase and lowercase letters. So when we really kind of break more into genetics, we'll call maybe different versions of genes alleles. We'll see that perhaps at the root of alleles, uh, what makes them perhaps different is perhaps they have slightly different DNA um, sequences, and so they're coding for slightly different proteins. So maybe this parent carries two different versions of the R gene, maybe one of them dominant in, in its expression pattern over the other one. Um, but parents could have maybe the exact same version of other genes. So that's what I tried to show here. Um, maybe other parents might carry very different versions of those genes. And so I just tried to show you other possibilities here. And so what's the point of sexual reproduction? The point is if this parent is reproducing reproductive cells that could help that parent reproduce sexually, then we're going to see that those cells will only have half of what that parent's body cells have. 
Um, that parent wants to pass on half of their genetics. And so what's interesting about sexual reproduction is that if you're passing on just half of your genetics, half of your chromosome sets, then you can pass on a different half to different offspring. Maybe in this particular reproductive cell, this parent uh, passed on the chromosome with the big R version of the gene. But um, if that parent were to produce other reproductive cells, they could easily pass on a different half, maybe the little r version um, on that chromosome. And if they uh, perhaps um, reproduce with another parent who have other versions of those genes, we can have quite a lot of variety in that new offspring. That offspring has um, uh, genes that are very different from either parent. And so that really is the hallmark which we'll expand on and the major advantage of sexual reproduction. The whole purpose of sexual reproduction is to generate genetic variety in offspring. Um, maybe you produce multiple offspring who have sort of different halves of both parents and so they might have similarities but they might also have differences. We're going to see that genetic variety is the, uh, a crucial um, necessity for evolution of species over generations. And so how do you generate genetic variety? One way to generate genetic variety is through sexual reproduction. So um, let's talk about asexual. If uh, a species were able to reproduce asexually, then that one parent would just be passing on all of the chromosomes onto the offspring. So that would pretty much um, largely guarantee that the offspring is a genetic clone of that parent. Now there is the possibility that they copy that, the DNA incorrectly and there are what we're gonna call mutations later. Mutation is the only way of genetic, generating variety in asexual reproduction. But for the most part, assuming that mutations are fairly rare, um, then an asexual reproduction would produce an exact genetic clone. And so that actually has advantages too. Um, if it doesn't sound like it has many advantages, first of all, there's no need to find a mate to reproduce with. And maybe in certain um, cases and populations or just sort of the, the struggle to win and compete for mates that's often found in many species. Um, you know, if, if it's difficult to find mates, you can still produce offspring. Um, both sexes can produce offspring. Uh, males and females who might be able to reproduce sexually of a species can also reproduce themselves asexually. And then maybe um, we can also think of it being useful to produce genetic clones in maybe stable, unchanging environments where that organism is already pretty well adapted to survive. Um, so I'm doing well, so let me produce exact genetic clones, and so probably my offspring will do well also. So there definitely are advantages to asexual reproduction. Um, let's just do a quick survey then to finish up this video of, of um, how different organisms reproduce. As it turns out, bacteria can only reproduce asexually. If they're going to want to generate genetic variety, they're going to have to have other mechanisms to sort of amplify the ability to change themselves over generations, which we'll explore later. Um, but most organisms are certainly capable of producing sexually, and actually um, more organisms than us can reproduce in both modes. So um, we'll kind of see that as well. Certainly we humans are only capable of reproducing sexually. So let's just kind of finish up by um, doing a quick survey of different types of organisms, um, uh, not humans in this case, and just different mechanisms they have for um, producing sexually or asexually and um, how they do that. So I just want to start with fungal reproduction. I, I, I don't want to say too much about this. As it turns out, spores and gametes are also produced by plants. Um, but I'm just going to kind of emphasize fungi here. We don't go through the full life cycles of different creatures anymore. At least I choose not to cover that in my um, um, new curriculum of AP Biology. So I just want to kind of briefly introduce the difference between spores and gametes. They're both reproductive cells. They both reproduce new offspring um, fungi. Um, so the basic difference between them is that spores do not uh, uh, join with another spore in order to produce a new offspring. Um, spores are released often by the mushroom structures or, or some kind of structure within fungi, um, perhaps spread to the wind, very lightweight, so that they can get somewhere else, perhaps land somewhere um, good for growth in that species. And a spore will uh, produce new cells and produce a new multicellular fungus all by itself. So a, a reproductive cell that can produce offspring without 
combining with another cell, um, which gametes typically then do. Gametes are egg and sperm, and egg and sperm fertilize in order to, pr to produce a new offspring. We'll see one slight exception to that, um, a case where unfertilized eggs can also grow, but since those eggs can also fertilize with sperm, we still call them gametes. Okay. So let's talk about how plants reproduce. Plants kind of face a special problem. Uh, they can't move. And so how do plants get their offspring, uh, uh, maybe reproduce sexually, and then um, disperse them to um, different places um, if they can't move? Well, um, we'll talk about kind of one broad group of plants here. The most successful plant group currently in biology are the flowering plants. Flowers are specialized structures carrying just a little bit of pollen, not spraying pollen everywhere like pine trees. Um, flowering plants instead just have a little bit of pollen and try to attract animal pollinators um, with the flower colors, with the scents, and with the nectar, the food is really the, the thing that the pollinator animals want. And in return, they'll, the, the pollinator animals might kind of rub up against some of the pollen. And if they fly to the, the flower of the next species, then perhaps um, they, uh, of the next uh, organism of that species, I should say, then they will help um, uh, deliver that pollen. And, and pollen really contains the sperm of plants. Um, so they're helping get the sperm to the egg of the next plant um, in another structure of that flower. And so flowers are helping with fertilization and sexual reproduction. And then let's talk about what flowers do if they successfully pollinate. Um, you can even artificially pollinate flowers with brushes, let's say. Um, um, uh, uh, from different plants. This is actually a jalapeno plant. Um, what happens to the uh, flowers of that species? Part of the flower will, um, it'll shed its petals and develop into a fruit. So what's the purpose of a fruit? A fruit structure is, um, has the purpose of helping get the offspring far away from the parent. Maybe it makes sense that plants wouldn't want to just drop their offspring right um, around them because then they'd be competing with their own children for survival um, and that wouldn't be good. So with fruits, the idea is perhaps um, uh, the broadest definition of a biological fruit is any structure that helps get seeds uh, far away or dispersed and the seeds contain the offspring inside. And so um, a very common way for plants to get their offspring seeds away, far away from them, is to produce an edible structure um, and maybe even advertise with a color change that they're ready for animals to eat them. Um, animals eat the fruits, um, get nutrition from it, uh, get calories from it, and they perhaps even eat the seeds. Um, and that can survive the digestive system. So when they poop somewhere else a um, long time uh, away, then they um, have dispersed the offspring somewhere else. So you're certainly familiar with all the different types of, of fruits that exist to distribute seeds. But um, we biologists define a fruit, again, as any structure that distributes offspring. Um, and so burrs can also represent fruits because there are seeds inside of them. And even helicopter fruits that kind of um, use the wind to travel far away represent a type of, of biological fruit. So anything that gets seeds far away is sort of the general plan. So what do flowers do and what do fruits do when it comes to plants? Plants can also asexually reproduce. And so I'll show an example of this in my class. Um, but this is just the idea, um, gardeners know this, that if you take enough of a chunk of a plant, like a stem or a root, and you um, give it plenty of access to nutrients and water and light. Um, it can regrow all of the other structures that it needs and become a clone of the original plant that it was cut from. So you could call this a cutting, um, or the, another term for this is vegetative reproduction. It's not reproduction involving flowers or fruits, it's sexual reproduction. Um, it's involving a vegetative part of the plant, like a root or a stem. So um, we'll show that in class two. Definitely a really neat ability that say we humans do not have. Um, and let's just kind of finish up by talking about some other animals and ways that they can reproduce. Um, sort of the almost the equivalent of vegetative reproduction is budding. And budding is just this idea that very simple animals like hydra um, might be able to produce offspring that kind of start as like a little bud kind of coming off of them, a growth that eventually develops and kind of pops off and then becomes a separate genetic clone offspring. 
Um, very simple. Let's talk about this concept of parthenogenesis. Um, one example is honeybees. Um, this is actually a very complicated term, and there are lots of different types of parthenogenesis in nature. Um, but the broadest definition that I care about for this course is it involves reproducing with eggs that never fertilize. Um, the female lays eggs, and they can um, just by themselves grow into a multicellular organism. As it turns out in honeybees, unfertilized eggs become male drones and fertilized eggs become females. So we still call them gametes, those eggs, not spores, because they can fertilize. Um, they just don't have to. Great. And then the last adaptation I just want to talk about is hermaphroditism um, or hermaphrodite animals. Um, hermaphrodites are fairly common, especially in slow moving animal species like, say, earthworms. Um, and all a hermaphrodite is is an animal that has both sex organs. So um, one animal can produce both sperm and egg. They often do not fertilize themselves, however, because the whole point of sexual reproduction is variety. So they want to get with another parent, another organism, and, and share sperm and egg. Um, but maybe this is just useful for particular uh, slow-moving species because whenever they encounter a member of their species, they can kind of guaranteed reproduce with them. Um, or just increases the chances of successful matings. So all I try to do is just kind of introduce some vocab to talk about the advantages of both asexual and sexual reproduction because many um, organisms can do both types. And so why would they want to do one versus the other? And then we just tried to illustrate a host of different reproductive adaptations.